All right, my friends. Before we get started on today's activity, let's talk briefly about homework. Your packet, the current packet, I'm going to collect next week because it has the instructions for the um, America in the World Part 2, which if you did America in the World Part 1, that essay a couple weeks ago will be no problem because this is just a short addition to it. If you did not do America in the World Part 1, then hurry up and do that one too. Now, there's a few people I haven't turned it in. Um, but the directions for the addition are in your current packet, the one that says a new world order on it. This packet has those instructions. This one you'll give to me next week, Wednesday. Nod your head yes? yes. Okay, good. All right. The new one I'm giving to you today because there's a reading that I want you to do for Windows. Well, not a reading. Uh, Crash Course Video Notes. Okay? So we can get started. This next unit is going to focus a lot on what was happening um, at home in the United States in the 50s, 60s, and going into the 1970s. Okay? This will be a topic which you know a lot about already. We're going to be talking about the Vietnam War, about Martin Luther King and the protests of the 1960s. This is a lot of fun, interesting unit going on. Okay? So this packet, start off with your first set of notes for Wednesday. The other packet you'll give to me Wednesday, so you have a nice long stretch between now and then. Lots of days of no school and a weekend to get everything taken care of. Any questions? Thoughts? Okay. All right. In that case, let's get started on today's stuff. Today, we're going to learn about the events of the Cuban Missile Crisis the closest the world ever came to nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Some historians, myself included, would consider these 13 days in October of 1962 to be the climactic event of the Cold War. All right. For this activity today, you have a packet that is just for today. These are yours, so put your name on it. As we give these out, I need to tell you straight up, do not read ahead. It will ruin the activity if you read ahead. So. Follow along, I'll guide you through the packet as we go. Give one to yourself. Okay. All right. Read the letter to the participants on the cover. This is an official memo from President Kennedy designating who was going to be on this XCOM. As I mentioned before, it's important to the integrity of the activity. It's a learning experience not to read ahead. Take a minute and read the cover. Today, the four of you are going to be a group. The four of you are going to be a group. The four of you will be a group today. And the four of you will be a group today. We're going to make five of you be a group today. So in a few minutes, Aronson and Kendall come on over so you can talk. We're going to have three of you be a group, and then four of you be a group today. Okay, so when the Cuban Missile Crisis started, when the first um, hints came into the White House of that there was a problem, Kennedy pulled together this executive committee, the XCOM, which is a special group of advisors. 
the president regularly meets with national security advisors, people who will help him out on those issues. But in this case, he knew it was a special event, so he brought in a special committee and included the regular national security advisors, but he also brought in some other people, like the special counsel, which is the lawyer for the White House. He also brought in his brother, the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, who was somebody he trusted. So he brought in a few extra people to give him advice. You are that executive committee now. Okay? No one here is going to play Kennedy. You're all going to be his advisors, giving him advice, telling him what you think should happen. Okay, so as a note of introduction, all the documents in this role play are real primary sources from 1962. Some of them have condensed. I took out parts um, that were extraneous, I guess. The overall character, the essential elements are there, intact. So um, you are dealing with the real thing that Kennedy dealt with and his advisors dealt with that time. Okay? Um, if you want to look them up, they're all at the Kennedy Library, which is in Boston. Um, and online. Okay, any questions? Okay, while you folks are reading, I'm going to be playing some Cuban music to get us in the mood. To start off, read documents one, two, and three, and complete the first decision page. Don't go beyond that.
Okay, there's most people finishing up here and starting to think about a decision. I want to point something out. What had happened in Cuba in the late 1950s? The overthrow by, who becomes the leader of Cuba? Fidel Castro, right? Fidel Castro is um, openly um, communist and um, the United States then becomes opposed to him. Many people who did not want communism in Cuba had fled to um, Florida, to the United States, so there's a strong anti-communist, anti-Castro Cuban population in Florida, even today. Um, but especially right after the revolution that happened in Cuba, the Americans are opposed to Castro, so Castro turns, of course, to who for support? Soviet Union. So all of a sudden, just a few miles from uh, Florida, from Miami, is this communist island. Um, so Americans are very opposed to this. And then what had just happened? The Americans had done what? You guys said it over here. The Americans had just done what with Cuba? What did you say first? Bay of? Pigs. Bay of Pigs, right? So a group of anti-Castro Cubans had wanted to go back to Cuba and throw Castro out. The CIA had helped to train them. This was one of Eisenhower's um, projects. When Kennedy becomes president, he gives the project a green light. These guys go and they land at a place called the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Does it go well? No, no. no this is terrible. Okay. They get caught on the beach. They thought the Cuban people would rise up and, you know, we hate Castro and let's join these, you know, anti-Castro people. Instead, Castro sent the army and the crew was getting slaughtered on the beach. They called for help. They said, hey, our friends back at the CIA in the United States, come in with the Air Force and help us out here so we don't all die on the beach. And Kennedy decided, no. He let the whole thing fail, which, of course, Makes the Americans look weak versus communism. Also makes Kennedy look a little weak. It was a big embarrassment for him that this big project had gone so badly. Okay. And in the end, um, Khrushchev looks at this, and what was noted in there, he says in the second paragraph, right, there's an unabated anti-Cuban campaign in the United States. No kidding. Okay. We'd even sponsored this invasion of Cuba. We're pretty obviously against them. For a long time, um, we were trying to assassinate Castro. We'd like put a bomb inside his cigar and poisoned his wetsuit. He used to like go swimming and stuff. So and we were pretty unashamedly anti-Castro. So when the Russians meet with Kennedy and they talk about how like, we know you're totally anti-Castro, they weren't kidding. We were. So, all right, talk to each other. What option do you recommend and why? thinking like <laughs> you're not warmongers not that hawkish what do you guys think? I think four. Wait, wait, two, I four, think or we think? We think four, two, four, one. <laughs> four, two, four, one. Two, four, one. So, so four and four and two or four or one. So we ask first. So that, you know, mm, okay. So there's a start low but threaten big. Yeah. Okay, write that down. They're not going to move it just because we say so. 
Maybe. Maybe they'll be scared. Is that the road you want to go down, Mr. Kenny? <laughs> I'm not sure the president's going to take that advice. What are we thinking? Three. Okay. What do we think? Three. Put in the blockade. What are we thinking? Six. Six. Which is a combination of? One and three. One and three. Blockade and invade? Straight up. You cross the line, here we come. Cavalry's coming. This is like the second Rough Riders. Okay. All right, one more minute to fi finish writing down your reason why. It was obvious though, they admitted it. They admitted to it here. You can, you can, if you want to say number six, you can pick certain parts. You can be creative in piecing together your response. Okay. You ready? We can't do nothing and invade them at the same time. Seems like you, yeah, you can't have it always. You gotta, gotta give some advice. All right, there's not unlimited time here. There's pressure because the days are passing. So, advice to Kennedy. I know you guys are still kind of debating. So, back in the corner, Caroline, what did you guys say? Wait. So number. Five, just wait and see. Could get worse now. This is like. Literally poking the bear. Okay. You don't want to. You don't want to like make more trouble. So just let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The food in my lunch bag is rotting, but I'll see what happens if I wait around another day. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. What do you guys say? Uh, we said four and number two. Four and two. Yeah. So, how's that gonna work? So like, it's like <laughs> first we say like, oh, like we know you have it. We ask them nicely. It's not like <laughs> okay. So there's like, a, we know you've got to take it out, or else yeah. we're gonna come in and take it out for you. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so start small, but you're going to ramp up. Not quite as ramping up as seriously as these guys, but the next step for you would be a blockade. Okay, in the corner. Three. Just put in the blockade. You guys cross the line. We're getting serious. No more stuff in Cuba. But not invade yet. Not try and blow it up yet. Okay. What did you, what was the first thing that you said? I have. I have children in the US. <laughs> you warmonger people over here. You're making trouble for your kids here, right? All right, you guys said? Three. three. Blockade also. Same reasons or anything else? Well, there is basically that you're announcing that you already know there's missiles because why else would you blockade them? You're going to put in the blockade, you got to say why, right? Okay. And? One and part of three. How does this work? Um, we realize that three kind of contradicts one. So we put that we blockade Cuba from getting any further help from the Soviet Union. And then, then we invade Cuba and destroy the missile. Full on. Cut out the cancer. <laughs> this is like the cancer of communism is invading the Western Hemisphere. We're not playing games here. 
cutting you off, going in, get rid of Castro, the whole nine yards, the modern Teddy Roosevelt coming in with the Rough Riders and take over the island. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do you guys think? Four. Just announce no serious military action. Yeah. Not like these guys over here. <laughs> You're hesitant. You want to. You're more stridently anti-communist. Let's go get them. <laughs> but your, your other teammates have decided yeah. that's too... We'll talk it up first. <laughs> talk it up first. All right. You are just like the real executive committee, or XCOM. There was dissension. Some people wanted more, some people wanted less. They argued with each other. Ultimately, they gave Kennedy some advice. And he decided to institute a blockade. But he called it a quarantine. Because a blockade officially, according to international law, is an act of war. So he made a blockade, but he called it a quarantine. Of course, what is a quarantine, really? Of, when do we use this word? For diseases, for infections, like when you bring your dog to Hawaii, you have to have a quarantine for your dog to make sure it's not going to bring in any diseases. You know, I have that quarantine for fruits and vegetables, that sort of thing. That's a quarantine, right? Okay. A blockade is something altogether different. But he called it a quarantine. He also told the country what was going on. So let's see his address. That statement also was false. This is a nice political way of calling your enemies a liar, right? You guys are lying to us. Mm. 
very scary for Americans to turn on the television and hear you're going to have a president address, so everyone tunes in to see what President Kennedy is going to say. And then he tells us, hey, the Russians are putting nuclear missiles in our backyard. This is upsetting a serious balance here of who can strike first and how quickly and without warning. And if you had been going to school your whole life and getting those, you know, messages about duck and cover and be careful about nuclear weapons and we're supposed to know when it's going to happen and suddenly maybe we won't know, this is pretty unsettling, right? Americans are terrified when this first came out. Okay. Come on. Read documents four and five. Complete the second decision. You'll notice that document four at the top, this is the letter that Kennedy sent to Khrushchev. It's two pages. And then, document five, Khrushchev sent a letter back. All right, take a look at these two letters.
So we're going to take another minute to read, and then we're going to talk about it. OK, I want you to take a look at Kennedy's letter first. We're going to point out a couple of things he says that are important. The first one connects directly to what we talked about in the last class. In the middle of the second paragraph there, he says, since I have not assumed that you or any other sane man would in this nuclear age deliberately plunge the world into war. Last class, we talked about the arms race and this idea of mutually assured destruction and that the whole system works if Everyone acts rationally and is sane. So Kennedy here is faced with the possibility now that maybe Khrushchev is not sane. So he's going to kind of reiterate the point like, hey, let's act you know, like logical people here. Let's not get carried away, right? And on the other side, he makes an interesting case here because some of you said we should just tell them take the missiles out and then threaten something else. And Kennedy decided, he wanted to do more than just demand. He puts in this the blockade called a quarantine because he wants to do something. So he points out, he says, the very end of the almost last paragraph, he says, the fact of this minimum response should not be taken as a basis, however, for any misjudgment on your part. That we're starting off small, but like you guys were saying, don't mess with us. We're serious here. We're just starting small because we don't want to go big. <laughs> like you guys over here are ready to invade, right? But he's basically telling them, don't mess with us. Now, he didn't promise what would happen next. He kept his options open. All right, if you flip over to Khrushchev's one, I love this letter. This is one of my favorite historical documents of all time. First off, imagine that we did this to you, basically. Of course, of course we can't do this, right? Just like you said. We can demand all we want, but of course they're not going to do it on the other side. Okay? He accuses Kennedy of starting the problem. The beginning of that second paragraph, he says, in presenting us with these conditions, you, Mr. President, have flung the challenge at us. And he went on television and told the world, Kennedy is making this problem. Kennedy has started this. I like it down there. He talks about quarantines. He says, quarantines exist, for example, on agricultural goods and products. He's calling them out on this one. And he says, you yourself know this. This is a blockade. You know it. You're lying. You're not supposed to be doing this. Straight up. At the end of the next paragraph, he says, um, you are no longer appealing to reason. You wish to intimidate us. He knows what Kennedy's up to. He's not going to buy it. Basically, it's a straight up challenge, right? On the other side, this is great. In the very center of the other side, he says, the folly of degenerate imperialism. You are a has-been. You used to be a great country. You used to rule Cuba and the Philippines, and now you don't. You are a used-to-be country. You are falling down in terms of power. And this is just your, like, grasping on to anything to make you look tough. They're calling him a loser without calling him a loser. This is great. All right, and then the very end of the other side, he says, we will then be forced on our part to take the measures we consider necessary and adequate in order to protect our rights. We have everything necessary to do so. So just as Kennedy finished his letter by saying, don't mistake our you know, small steps to be a sign of weakness, Khrushchev says, don't think we won't shoot back either. All right, talk to each other. What about the second decision?
He is. He's calling your bluff. You put up this quarantine to see if he'd play chicken and stop, and then, no. <laughs> How oh, very Mr. Reagan of you to want to make some Star Wars system. Yes. Yeah. You're 20 years too early though. <laughs> oh, Kevin, don't zone out. I don't know. This was a hard case. <laughs> Good job, <Earth. laughs> What do we think? Do nothing else, just hold the blockade? Write down, you got your reason why? What do we think? Are you still ready to invade? <laughs> Put it all on the table? Four. Now we should do four, because then we'll sound like pissed at each other. You were all ready to fight, and now you're like, no, 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 no I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right, 30 seconds, finish your thoughts. Why are you going to do what you want to do? To roll the dice. What do you think? Three. <laughs> we decided? All right. Are you stretching or you had a question? Uh -huh, I was stretching. Okay. <laughs> Three, hmm? <laughs> now, the question page points out that the Air Force here, you've been talking to the Air Force generals, They've been coming into these meetings and they're saying, now we don't know if we can get everything. We can try, but no guarantee we'll hit it all. You know, we'll do our best. So, anyone still ready for the full invasion? Number one. <laughs> no, not anymore. There no, no go on, nobody's gonna ready to invade. Okay. Number two, a limited airstrike. Go in, try to get all the missiles, cross your fingers, you get them all. Anyone for airstrikes? The military generals were all about this one at this time. They were really putting a lot of pressure on Kennedy. Just go take care of it. Let's not do a full invasion, but let's at least get rid of the missiles. All right, number three, continue the blockade, but no military action. Three? No? All right, most of us, three. Okay, why three? You're taking him seriously. Yeah. But okay, we did the blockade already. Let's just keep the blockade. We're not going to back off and feel like, oh, we're scared of you now, but hold the line. All right, we had two teams who didn't like that idea. What'd you guys say? Four. Four, Four is do nothing now and see what happens. So take the blockade off and then just, okay, chill. Let's everyone take a step back and calm down. This is like when you have a fight with your friend in elementary school and your teacher's like, oh, you go sit over there and, and chill out and then we'll talk about it. Okay? All right? Humans are not that different. Adults are not that different from children, right? And you guys thought? Four. So you were all ready to invade a couple days ago and now all of a sudden you're like, okay, no, 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 nothing. Just sit and watch. I don't know if I want you as my advisor. You're pretty inconsistent. <laughs> or, as you were saying, you got new information maybe? Oh, okay. So maybe you're good advisors. You're willing to change your mind based on new information. Okay, we'll see that. All right, what did Kennedy do? The blockade was continued. One ship arrived at the blockade line to the American Navy and they let it through. It was not carrying any weapons. So they let a ship through the blockade. An American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba. We were flying around taking more pictures 
And somebody down below fired a missile and it shot down the plane. The American pilot died. The top military leaders in Washington talking to Kennedy were furious. They said, they shot first. We need to respond. You don't let somebody throw a punch and hit you in the face without at least doing something back. Like, there's no turning the other cheek in this case, right? Okay. And Kennedy said, no. He would not shoot back. Okay. He was very hesitant to believe that this was an official order from Khrushchev. He thought some 18-year-old kid down there running the missile station got trigger happy and pressed the, you know, he didn't want to have a nuclear war start from what may have been a mistake. Or something perhaps small. One plane gets shot down is different from nuclear annihilation of the world. He kind of figures, well, let's not go overboard yet. The military was furious with him. All right. At the United Nations, this guy, Adlai Stevenson, who'd run for president a couple times as a Democrat and always lost, and um, was generally thought of as sort of a weak character. This was like his retirement job in a way, it was to go to be ambassador to the UN. Now he's got to go there, and he's got to show the world that we're not making this whole thing up. This is perhaps in a public life his finest moment. So let's see him at the United Nations. We do. Now, they all have headsets and there's a delay in everything because there's translators behind. So we'll speak in English and then we wait for the guy to translate to Russian, for the Russian guy to understand and he speaks in Russian and then we wait. So you'll see that everyone here is used to waiting a minute before they answer. Okay? Now, do they know a little of each other's language? Yeah, yeah they do. At least some. Let me ask you oh. one I'll plug it in. All right, so this is Adlai Stevenson talking in the beginning. Let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorn, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? Mr. Stevenson, would you continue your statement, please? You will receive the answer in due course. Do not worry. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. I love this. This is great. And I'm also prepared to present the evidence in this room. Okay. So uh, this is like two kids fighting on the playground, right? But it's adults with nuclear missiles behind them. Yeah, this is, this is great. Like, I'm prepared to wait till hell freezes over. What a what great calling each other out. And then he brings out the satellite photos in the room. This is broadcast around the world on television, this conversation that they're having. And essentially, the United States shows the Russians started this. This is the Soviet Union made this problem for the world. They put the missiles there first. We're not making this up just to instigate some fight, you know. You've been lying about this. They've said over and over, we're not doing anything offensive in Cuba. Even here, he was like, oh, I'm not going to answer your question. That's rude to be asking me this kind of thing and accusing us of this bad deal. And then Stephen says, as, here's the proof, everybody. They're lying. It's a major public relations win. A lot of countries in the world have been on the side of the Soviet Union, saying, look, Kennedy is this super anti-communist guy. He's trying to start a war. And then they see it, and they realize the Russians have been lying to us. Kennedy's trying to protect the world and public opinion in the world shifts. It's a really big deal for Kennedy. All right. Yeah. Were the people in the video laughing? Yeah. Yeah. Or like, oh my god, did you hear what he said? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's great. All right. Meanwhile, the Soviets continue to set up the missiles in Cuba at an ever-increasing pace. They've also begun unpacking and assembling some bomber planes that were um, packaged up. In the US, the military is amassing troops in Florida and Louisiana to prepare for a massive invasion. They're getting ready for option one. The nuclear um, force is on high alert. Everybody's ready. The planes are in the air, flying with nuclear weapons, loaded up, ready to get the alert to turn and head for Russia. Around the world, people have begun holding 24-hour prayer sessions and rallies for peace. 
the Pope is out there at St. Peter's Basilica on the balcony 24 hours a day praying with people for peace. The same deal is happening pretty much everywhere on earth. Read documents 6, 7, 8. Now, I'm going to pause because we don't have a lot of time left. So look to document 6. October 26th, Khrushchev sends a letter to Kennedy with an offer of a deal. Okay. If you flip, document 7 I want you to skip. It's not essential. Document 8 is October 27th. It's the next day. Khrushchev sends another letter with a different offer. Okay. So read those two and then do the third decision.
Okay, most of us have finished reading, so there's two letters with two different offers. What's the offer in the first letter? Better than the second. <laughs> I get better. What is the deal? He offers in the first letter, October 26. What will the Americans do and what will the Russians do? Yes, the Americans promise never to invade Cuba. And in turn, the Soviets will take out the missiles. It's a trade. Everyone gives up something, everyone gets something that they want. Okay. But then, a day later, on the 27th, a new letter comes in, which says, Ah, not only do you have to promise not to invade Cuba, but you also have to take out missiles from Turkey. Turkey is one of our NATO allies, still is. They're right on the border with the Soviet Union. And, like Khrushchev says, like the soldiers there are looking at each other over the border. And here the Americans have put nuclear missiles in Turkey. Now, these particular missiles, they were called Jupiter missiles, they were getting old and they were going to get removed anyway pretty soon. But there's a danger in doing this kind of a trade, right? What happens if you take the deal and then a year later, oh, Khrushchev puts uh, some missiles back in Cuba again, and then this time he says, all right, we'll take the missiles out if you give us West Berlin. Then he turns around another year or two later and he does the same thing, and he says, all right, this time we'll take them out if you give us South Korea. There's a danger in taking these kind of deals. Also, it's weird that he sent two letters with two different deals. Could be a couple things. One, it could be that he's not in charge anymore. At some point overnight, his generals or other people in the Soviet Union took power, basically told him, you're not in charge anymore, we're running the show, you're going to continue talking as if you are the leader, but if the hardliners in the Soviet Union have taken over, it's a lot more dangerous now. This would be like if those generals who wanted Kennedy to go to war right from the start had taken over. It's a more dangerous situation. Or it could be that just like Kennedy or Khrushchev is scared and he's trying to find something that Kennedy will take. He sent this letter, I haven't heard anything back, well, let me try something else. Let's, let's see what else he'll do. Okay. And he's just fishing around. But we don't know. There's no hotline yet to call him up and talk to him. All right. What are you going to do? You've got to be creative. If you can't solve the problem, the sun may not come up tomorrow. <laughs> what do you think? Which one? Or do you have some other agreement? You're going to come back and offer him something else. What do you think? What's your gut tell you to do? <laughs> Make a deal? Hmm. So maybe deal making is the time has passed. It's time for something else. Like what? <laughs> what does that mean? Talk to each other. What do you think? <laughs> Included in number two. Number two is that and take the missiles out. What do you think? What's your gut tell you to do? Doesn't seem fair. You've been kind of pushing your weight around this whole time, right? With these quarantine business and all this. Hmm. But they have been lying to the world, so. Hmm. What do you guys think? Keep prepping the military. Prepping our men. 
What if they strike first? What if they're tired of waiting for you? You are not accepting any deals? Maybe they think, they think, well, Kennedy's not taking any deals. Looks like he's ready for war, so we better strike first. <laughs> it's the only place out of range in the map, right? <laughs> We're all going to Seattle. Hmm. I don't know if that's feasible here. You got your military ready to go. Are you going to use it? Or are you going to wait for them to shoot first? Well, they shot already. They shot If in the middle of the night they strike, you go to bed waiting to see what will happen and you don't wake up. Hmm. All right, there was not unlimited time. You have two minutes to make up your minds. What should Kennedy do? They do still lose letters. It's sent electronically now, <laughs> but it's still formalized in a fancy kind of way. They can talk to each other, though. Nowadays, I don't know about it. I don't think they text. It seems like a security danger to have the president with a cell phone. <laughs> Usually they talk on the phone now. <laughs> All right, let's hear some thoughts. How many of you are going to take the first deal? Send them a letter, we take the first deal. Pretend you like the second letter got lost in the mail or something. Who's going to take the first deal? Anybody? All right, no on the first deal. How about take the second deal? Okay, why? You, a lot of people like this, take the second deal. Why the second deal? Why not the first deal? Oh, what do you mean all about honesty? Um, like second deal sounds more fair. And you guys were saying something similar, right? Why is the second deal fair but the first one's not? Nice and loud because they're cutting grass or whatever. You gotta say a little louder, I'm old. Khrushchev makes a good point. You're more likely to get him to accept the deal if it seems more fair. Does anyone else who wants to take the second deal have any other thoughts as to why? All right, who's decided that the time for negotiating is over? There's no more chance of this. We're going to have nuclear war. We better shoot first. You're ready for the end of the world here? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you guys, some of you were also on to this. Yeah? Who, you were saying too, like, it's time just for war. Yeah? Enough talk. Yeah? Spoiler alert, we didn't have nuclear war. <laughs> didn't turn out that way. Okay. Um, here at the end of this day, Kennedy has to make this choice about what to do. And his advisors, like you guys, were split. And he went and he talked to the person he trusted absolutely the most, which is his younger brother, Robert Kennedy. And the two of them went and they sat down and they decided that they were going to publicly take the first deal and secretly take the second. Kennedy 
sent an open letter to Khrushchev. He said, we promise not to invade Cuba if you take your missiles out. In the middle of the night, his younger brother, Robert Kennedy, who was only young 30s, I think, um, at the time, went to the Russian embassy late at night. He went in the back door so people would not see him going there. He met with a guy at the embassy. It was not the ambassador who had originally um, uh, contacted them about this, about meeting privately. And at first, Kennedy and his advisors were like, who is this guy? Is this some random person making himself up to sound important? Like, it's a total distraction. They did some research on him. They found out this kind of low-ranking Soviet official had been one of Khrushchev's buddies in World War II. They had fought side by side. So just like Kennedy trusts his brother the most, this one guy who actually wasn't that important in the Soviet government was one of Kennedy, uh, Khrushchev's old buddies, was the guy he trusted the most. So Bobby Kennedy and this guy, Khrushchev's friend, meet in the middle of the night, and Bobby Kennedy says, we'll do the second deal also, but it has to be a secret. You can never tell that we made this deal, and we're going to wait. We're not going to take the missiles out of Turkey right away. We'll do it a few months from now so it doesn't seem like it was a deal. We'll secretly take the second deal, and the guy on the other side of the table across from Bobby Kennedy says, all right, we're sane people. Just like the song said, we love our children too. Like you're saying, we have kids too. We'll make the deal. So they publicly take the first deal. They secretly take the second deal. The world did not know about it for many, many, many years until these documents were declassified years after the fact. We did not know. So what's the outcome? Did we ever invade Cuba? Nope. As promised, we never invaded Cuba. We put sanctions on there, we refused to do business with them. We tried to get our friends to not do business with them. When did the sanctions on Cuba end? When? Last year. Last year. Obama finally said, after like some 60 years or something of having these sanctions that are not getting rid of Castro, Castro's still alive, now his younger brother's in charge, you know, Fidel Castro's retired because he's old, and never changed communism in Cuba, they still have it there, even after the Soviet Union fell apart, Castro is still in charge, and Obama said, finally, this is it. We've tried this for years and years and years. It's not working. We're going to give up on the sanctions. We'll sell them all kinds of American stuff. We'll put Costco in Havana, and then the people will love capitalism. I don't know. We're, we're just opening up now. That's the beginnings of business related to Cuba. We'll see what happens. Fidel Castro and his younger brother, Raul Castro, who's in charge now, are both very old. I don't know what's going to happen. Things will change sometime in the near future, in your lifetime, you'll see things change with Cuba. I don't know, but for years. They did take their missiles out of Cuba. In fact, they left them there for kind of a long time. We didn't realize until many years later how long they had left them there. But they did eventually take them all out. We took our missiles out of Turkey, as promised, and we never had nuclear war. We got away with it. We walked up very much to the brink, and we didn't have nuclear war. Hmm. What do you think? Ms. Kobashigawa loves to give this assignment after she talks about the Cuban Missile Crisis. What, what grade would you give Kennedy? If you could give him a report card on his handling of the crisis. He gets an A? An A plus. No nuclear war, he gets an A plus. Who else does say? He gets an A. He did a good job. How about a B? Could have been better, but pretty good. A B minus. <laughs> Close to a C. How many people say a C? This is only a mediocre job as leader of the free world. Anyone with a D? Barely passing? A D? Anyone F? Like he, he flunked. He just messed this up. No nuclear war, but no. We're at least going to give him a passing grade on handling the crisis. So if there was going to be a crisis like this in the future, who would you want to be the president running the show? What, not Trump? You don't like Trump? <laughs> Any, anyone running that you would trust? Ben Carson. Ben Carson. You'll take Ben Carson. No, not Ben Carson. Hmm. This is, ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis, this has been one of the tests that people have in their mind. Who would I trust in a crisis like this? Now, there's an interesting side story. After the fact, it came out that Kennedy had just recently read a book that was popular at the time called The Guns of August. He's a, a famous historian in America, um, did a lot of research on World War I. I 
forget her name now, I'm sorry. But she wrote this book called The Guns of August, which is about August of 1914, when the First World War started, about how the leaders of Germany and France and the other countries in Europe had sort of plunged themselves into war because they wouldn't stop their original plans. Their plans had said, on this day we'll do this, on this day we'll do this, because on day 30-something we'll win. And that the, for them, they were so entrenched in their, now we must do this next, or they did this, so we must respond, that they wouldn't stop. And so Kennedy had this in mind, and he said, you know, World War I, he thought, could have been avoided if the leaders had been willing to stand up to the military generals and say, no, we're not going to go through with your plans you've been working on for so long. We're going to negotiate. We're going to try and stop this peacefully. Kennedy made the military leaders in America furious, but he avoided something that he had just read about happening years before. So a good example of the lessons of history. Hmm. Okay, knowing what America has done, dealing with the Cold War and with Russia and dealing with the Cuban Missile Crisis, your job is to add to your original essay your final thoughts. The directions are in your packet. You also have a reading to do for, um, to start our next topic. I'll see you on, well, I'll see you tomorrow very briefly, but I will see you for class, class, on Wednesday. Until then, have a good weekend. Good job solving the Cuban Missile Crisis.